Happy Friday! Welcome to book club number two. Ooh, the adventures of Miss Pettifor. All right, we gotta find it. There's all those cats. Okay, this chapter is called Miss Pettifor and the Rattling Spoon. Some adventures are so small, you hardly know they've happened. Like the adventure of sharpening your pencil to the perfect point just before it breaks and that little bit gets stuck in the sharpener. <laughs> that, I think we could agree, is a very small adventure. Other adventures are so big and last so long, you might forget they are adventures at all, like growing up. And some adventures are just the right size, fitting into a single magical day. And these are the sort of adventures Miss Pettifor had. No one knew where Miss Pettifor got her name. Did an ancient Pettifor invent those fancy iced cakes called Petty Fours, which conveniently rhymes with spaghetti store. Mm -hmm. You know, those miniature cakes that disappear in one bite. Mm. Cake so small you don't have to share. Was it because one of her great, great, great grandfathers was such a splendid baker of little cakes? Or was it because he was simply so very good at eating them? Miss Pettifor herself was an expert at both. There she is with her little plate full of cakes. Mm. If Miss Pettifor were short and if she were a bird, you might say she was as prim and proud as a sparrow. But Miss Pettifor was not short. She was tall, and so you'd have to say she was spindly as a stork. Her legs were as thin as a string with two knots for her knees and two knots for her ankles. And just as one might expect from someone who likes to fly, she had billowy hair that she wore all bushed up in a tumbling bun. The more she brushed up, the more it came down and the misty wisps floated around her head. She liked to wear a woolen coat that flounced when she walked and jingled with a row of silver buttons. Almost everything she wore, except her shoes, ended in zigzagging scallops of lace and rickrack. She was especially fond of pockets, paisley, playful patterns, and anything hand knitted. So yeah, she's got a little lacy ricky rack edges on everything she's got on. True, everything, all of it, except for her shoes, little skinny legs. Mm -hmm. All right, on windy days, Miss Pettifor always took her cats out for an airing. There was Minky, Misty, Taffy, Persia, Pirate, Mustard, Mutard, Hemdala, Earring, Grigorovich, Clasby, Captain, 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 Catkin, Captain, Clothespin, Your Shyness, and Sizzles. The cats like to be aired. They like to feel the wind pick up every one of their hairs and set them down again gently as if the wind were looking for something. In one hand, Miss Pettifor would hold the littlest cat, Minky, and with the other, she would choose her favorite tea party tablecloth, bringing together the four corners in her fist and straightening her arm into the wind. Immediately, the tablecloth would puff up like a biscuit in the oven and swiftly, am I missing a page? Uh-oh, and swiftly, Miss Pettifor's shiny shoes would lift from the earth. Ooh. Then one by one, here we go, 
Minky Misty, Taffy Persia, Pirate Mustard, Mutard, Hemdala, Earring, Grigorovich, Clasby, Captain, 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 Cat King, Captain, Clothespin, and Your Highness with little but long sizzles at the end. Lifted off with Miss Pettifor, each cat with its tail wrapped into another. How the cats love their, they love their flights with Miss Pettifor. The cat swung down like a strand of wool or a skipping rope or a loose hair ribbon. 16 cats dangling in one gigantic puss tail. <laughs> then when Miss Pettifor spotted her destination below the bakery or the bookshop or the cream and cream bun cafe, the cat's favorite, she, ne she neatly shortened the sail and drifted down, landing tidily on her toes, followed by her dozens of dainty little paws as the waterfall of cats poured and purred into the street. The cats had to be careful of their tails when landing so as not to get tangled in the trees and laundry lines and gargoyles and other such obstacles. Everyone in the village was used to Miss Pettifor's mode of travel, and no one blinked an eye except to say, hello. Miss Pettifor always traveled by tablecloth. That is to say, by air. First, she would take a measure of the meteorologic, meteorol, I can't say that word, meteorological <laughs> circumstances, the weather, okay? That is to say, the weather. Then she would position herself accordingly, only attempting errands that were pro propitious, that is to say, favorable. In short, she would fly in whatever direction the wind blew her. If the wind were blowing eastward, for example, she would go to the pet shop to browse for the latest in cat toys and to Mr. Patel's bakery for treats with icing, whipped cream, or crunchy crusts, and to Miss Carruthers', Carruthers grocery shop, where the avocado pears were always exactly right, neither too hard nor too quaggy. That is a way to say squeezy. But if the wind were westerly, she would take advantage of the fact and do her Banking, then visit the bookshop, the zoo, Mr. Climo's hardware store, and take something in for repair to Mr. Pomeroy, who would visit, who could fix anything that had springs in it. A watch, a wind-up toy, a mechanical hat. What? Mr. Pomeroy loved springs ever since he was a boy, and he, so he made them his life's work. What use is a job if it doesn't have springs in it, he would say. And of course, he was perfectly right. Okay, it's getting really dark in here. I need to turn on the light. That's better. That's better. Okay. Miss Pettifor did not live far from the village, just a short flight. And she always liked to hover above and admire the view. Each shop had a big wooden sign that swung and creaked in the breeze. And every sign was in the shape of what was sold in the shop. So for example, the sign for Mr. Patel's bakery was in the shape of great wooden cupcake. And the sign for Mrs. Collarwaller, Collarwaller's bookshop was a giant book. And the sign for Mr. Climo's hardware shop was a gigantic hammer. In this way, the village was friendly to everyone, even the youngest who didn't yet know how to read, or to a stranger who spoke a foreign language. Everyone would know which shop was which, and no one would go into the bakery expecting to buy a pair of shoes. Mrs. Collarwaller, the bookseller, was a particular friend of Miss Pettifor, and the bookshop was one of Miss Pettifor's favorite places. There were two sides to Mrs. Collarwaller's shop, one side for adventure books and the other for books in which nothing ever happens. 
Personally, Mrs. Collarwaller preferred books where nothing ever happens. But she understood that sometimes we feel the need to visit another planet or to run away to sea to meet pirates or to fall down holes or to be blasted by a volcano and that sort of thing. So one side of the shop was the ho-hum and the other was the hum. Although which was which depended on what sort of book the customer liked best. Mrs. Collawaller herself mostly liked books where people sat knitting by the fire with a plate of biscuits and a mug of steaming cocoa beside them. Dreaming about the day Lord Somersault or Lady Hopscotch would come to tea with detailed descriptions of all they would eat, buttery shortbread that greases your fingers, jelly donuts oozing fruit, eclairs dripping in chocolate and full of air, not to mention crisp Florentines, fluffy Napoleons, and custardy custard squares. Mm. Mrs. Cotterwaller loved books in which people talked a lot and thought aloud, had dreams, discussed recipes, and looked at each other with affection. She liked books full of interesting facts that would never come in useful and were therefore always the most fascinating sort of facts to know. For example, the kind of food ostriches like best or the history of doilies or all the movies in which the Isetta bubble car appears or important details concerning the invention of shoelaces. And it bears repeating anything involving doilies. Doilies are those little lace circle things. Wise Mrs. Collarwaller was convinced that if, she, if you knew these sorts of things, you were more likely to bump up against occasions when such inf information was needed. Just as if you had an ice cream machine in your kitchen, you were far more likely to eat ice cream than not. But then there were others who believed that having an ice cream machine meant exactly the opposite. That one would tire of homemade chocolate marshmallow ribbon and therefore rarely eat it at all. And of course, this discussion was just the sort of thing Mrs. Collarwaller liked to read about and would be in a book one would find in the ho-hum, or was it the hum, half of her bookstore. People often say that children have no use for long words, but frankly, Mrs. Collarwaller found this never to be the case. In her vast experience, children loved books that contained words such as preposterous, perambulator, and gesticulate, especially if they all ended up in the same sentence. The kind of word your tongue could get tangled up and lost in. She was very helpful to her young customers, suggesting, for example, that if they wished to finish reading a particular book before they fell asleep, then they better start reading while still in the bathtub. That way, they'd be on page 33 by the time they were pulling their arms into their pajama sleeves and more than halfway by the time their head was on the pillow. Mrs. Collarwaller had many good ideas, such as printing an entire story on one's pillowcase so that there was always something to read if one woke up in the middle of the night. Of course, like all the best booksellers, she kept a fresh supply of flashlights and batteries by the cash register for those who liked to read under the blankets. Miss Pettifor and Mrs. Collawaller spent many enjoyable hours drinking tea together in the bookshop and playing a game they were both extremely fond of, thinking up titles for books too silly ever to be written, written such as, Beware, I'm coming to rob you any minute, or Warning, last page is missing, or This book is a waste of time, <laughs> or how do you care for the fish in your shoe? Or, don't bother, all the pages are stuck together. Or, I think I'm asleep. <laughs> Those are terrible titles for books. <laughs> do you know what a discretion is? Well, of course you do. A discretion is like quicksand or a whirlpool. Sometimes you just can't find your way out of one. It's 
that part of a story that some people think is the most fun when the story wanders off the point and gets lost, giving all sorts of information that was nothing to do with getting us from the beginning to the end. A digression is just like what happens when you're walking to school, you stop to tie your shoelace and notice the neighbor's dog looking at you. And so you stop to give it a pat and then you see a fence has started to fall down. And so you have to climb it just a little and then you look up and realize the clouds are in the shape of pianos. And then, oh dear, you suddenly remember you were on your way to school and you have to run all the rest of the way so you won't be late. That is a digression. Now, where were we? Miss Pettifor's 16 cats were very fond of arts and crafts. They especially loved to make elaborate costumes for themselves and to decorate absolutely everything. And so off they would go with Miss Pettifor through the air to the Sew-A-Lot shop. The shop sign was a big spool of thread where they collected ribbons and shimmery satin delicate lace and nubbly wool, small panels of crepe paper, squares of felt, bolts of plush velvet, bushels of buttons and reams of silver foil. They would return home to sew, knit, cut, paste, tie, scrunch, fold, drape, tape, crochet, embroider, and generally decorate away. Ooh, look at all the decorations they've done. They are some crafty kitties. <laughs> the cats decorated each other and then displayed themselves in dramatic poses on the carpet or dripping from the arms of Miss Pettifor's overstuffed chairs. Sometimes they even decorated Miss Pettifor, adorning her with feathers and fabric. The puss cats were also fond of making themselves into sculptures, swirly structures that were just for show. They liked to pretend they were fancy staircases, balconies, wrought iron banisters, baskets and chandeliers, and they often needed a tail detangler to sort themselves out afterwards. And when they were finally tired from all their artistic activity, they would fall asleep in the hammock in the back garden, dreaming of buns sodden with freshly whipped cream and vats of dripping chocolate. Or sometimes they joined Miss Pettifor for a nap on the sunny porch where they would lie in a lovely mound of cozy and tangled cat spaghetti with a hum and a ho-hum book open across Miss Pettifor's lap. Sometimes stories will have three special words right in the middle of them, like three shiny buttons down a shirt front or of a dress, or three shiny screws in a shiny hinge. These three little words, then one day, open a story like a tiny key. Words are often keys, as your parents have no doubt told you, and open things very nicely. Please, thank you, yes, no, may I? So now, before the ho oh, creeps forever ahead of the hum, let us use those three little words. Then one day, as Miss Pettifor was setting the table for tea, she noticed the empty marmalade pot with the spoon still in it. Could it be true? She rattled the silver spoon in the empty jar and rattled it again because she liked the sound it made. Well, this was surely one of the most unheard of things she had ever heard of. Tea time without marmalade? It was unthinkable, though she had just thought of it. It was the most unthinkable thought she had ever thought. Without a moment to lose, Miss Pettifor chose a tablecloth and called her cats around her and rushed into the garden for a liftoff. Miss Pettifor was very particular about which tablecloths she chose for her flights with cats. A sunny day called for a starched white cloth, so she would seem to be floating gracefully from a cloud. 
A rainy day called for a transparent plastic tablecloth, as invisible as the rain itself, and in autumn, when the sky was a deep shade of plum or gray, Miss Pettifor brought out her brightest, most colorful cloth, so that the reds, oranges, and golds would glow against the dark sky, and anyone looking up would think that the top of a beautiful autumn tree had lifted from its trunk and was floating away. And today, because they were simply off to the shops, Miss Pettifor had her trusty Paisley cloth in hand. Paisley was Miss Pettifor's choice for everyday jolly fun, just because she liked the swirls and curls so much. Unfortunately, however, the wind was blowing in the direction of the bank and not in the direction of Mrs. Carruthers' grocery shop. Miss Pettifor stood for a moment thinking what to do. It is often the case that the wind is not blowing in the right direction. This is just another tiresome fact of life. The, like the fact that, you, that your feet grow too big for your favorite shoes or that your favorite crayon gets shorter and shorter and more the more you use it. Perhaps, thought Miss Pettifor, she could ride the wind the wrong way and circle around the whole globe to Mrs. Carruthers' shop. Well, do you think this is wise? <laughs> to go the wrong way to get somewhere, the more Miss Pettifor thought about it, the more she liked the idea, for she liked circles. <laughs> and anything made in the shape of a circle, donuts, biscuits, pancakes. So she straightened her arm to the wind and off they flew. It was very gusty, but definitely not a wind for marmalade. It was a wind for Mr. Clemo's hardware shop, a wind for buying chocolate, oh, chocolate, a wind for buying doorknobs and sandpaper squares, and for distinctive hardware shop smell of nails and paint. It was a wind for eyeglasses, pinch purses, stationery, paper clips, soccer balls, and car repair, but it was most definitely not a win for buying marmalade. The last cat on the line, the slender ginger named Sizzles, wasn't so keen on circular things. He liked things that went one way at a time. Long things he could eat one end to another, not things that always took you back to where you started. He liked sausages, french fries, linguini and licorice ropes. Little but long sizzles did not approve of going the wrong way to get where you want to go. So as they passed the town hall, sizzles stretched as far as he could and boldly captured the top of the clock tower, wrapping his tail around it. Miss Pettifor and all her cats suddenly twang to a stop midair, and there they quavered, suspended in the high wind, sixteen tails taut as a wire, stiff as a clothespin across the town. Sizzles had stopped the flight. Check him out, y'all. He's like, nope. They're not going anywhere. That's why I like sizzles. How many more pages is this? Ooh, lordy. Okay. The wind was now quite a bit more than a gusty gust, and the line of cats stiff as a cable stood out against the white sky like a fuzzy streak of black marker on a white piece of paper. Meanwhile, another word that opens up stories like a little key. Meanwhile, before Mrs. Carruther, who happened to be sweeping the pavement outside her grocery shop, looked up, she no she looked up because she because her sweet son Carlos Cornelius Carruther, sitting in his perambulator, had let out a shrill gurgle and was pointing eagerly, one might say, gesticulating to the cats in the sky. The giggling baby looked proud as babies often do. Babies like to feel proud. There he is. He's in his perambulator and he is gesticulating. <laughs> I love these words. All right. Mrs. Carruthers 
took up her binoculars, which always hung by a red ribbon around her neck. She was an avid bird watcher and focused them on the strange arrangement in the sky. And she saw Miss Pettifor hovering above the town hall about a block away, mouthing the word marmalade. <laughs> Generous Mrs. Carruther understood the difficulty at once. She hurried into her shop and without a thought to the expense, snatched a pot of thick cut orange marmalade from the shelf. She ran with her baby in the perambulator to the town hall, climbed to the roof and bravely clinging to the shingles held out the pot. Immediately it was seized by sizzles and passed from paw to paw from sizzles to your shyness to Captain Clothespin to Captain Catkin to Captain Captain to Clasby to Grigorovich to Earring to Her Hem Hemdala to Mutard to Mustard to Pirate to Persia to Taffy to Misty to Minky who plopped it into Miss Pettifor's basket. In order to seize the pot of marmalade, however, Sizzles had to unwind his tail from the roof and at that very same instant of snapping up the marmalade of off the cats shot like an arrow on the roaring wind while they madly passed the jar up the line. The flight was on. Now, at the very edge of the village toward which Miss Pettifor and the cats were racing at high speed, a little red sports car with the top down happened to be waiting at a stoplight. Who was in it but the debonair, that is to say charming and really very shy, Mr. Coney Bear, the owner of the Coney Bear's confetti the king of confetti himself. Mr. Coney Bear was rather fond of Miss Pettifor and was far too timid to tell her so. In fact, at that very moment waiting for the stoplight, he had been daydreaming, trying to think of ways he might earn her friendship. Now, it must be made very clear that it is not the case that Miss Coney Bear, Miss Mr. Coneyberry had been aimlessly driving around the village hoping to catch a glimpse of Miss Pettifor, but truly and absolutely a wild coincidence that just then, at the very moment he was waiting at the stoplight, there blew another particularly gusty gust that was just about to carry Miss Pettifor and her cats all the way around the world in the wrong direction. Oh, Lord. And it also must be said that now that they had their marmalade, Hungry Sizzles was more determined than ever to get home to his tea and not go the wrong way around to get there. And so Sizzles, the last cat on the line, catching sight of his chance cleverly and just in time, tucked his tail around Mr. Coney Bear's steering wheel and with one quick tail action, quick, captured the car. Of course, Mr. Coney Bear was delighted to be of service. With Sizzle's tail curled neatly around Mr. Coney Bear's steering wheel, Miss Pettifor and the cats hitched a ride against the wind back to Miss Pettifor's cottage, singing gleefully all the way. Hullaba one, hullaba two, hullaba loo, hullaba mew. Down the road they sped, Miss Pettifor and her tablecloth like a paisley balloon attached to the little red sports car by a furry string. <laughs> All the way to sizzles. Sizzles on the steering wheel, sizzles for the win. <laughs> Miss Pettifor believed firmly that every adventure passed her doorstep, 
even just a jaunt to the grocery store must end with a tea party and the dashing Mr. Coney Bear was invited. In the middle of the table in a silver bowl was placed the precious marmalade, which glowed like gold in its shining dish. Before Minky, Misty, Taffy, Persia, Mo Mustard, Mutard, Hemdala, Earring, Clasby, and your shyness, who all loved round things, Miss Pettifor placed huge bowls of frothed milk. And before Pirate, Grigorovich, Captain, 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 Catkin, Captain Clothespin, and Sizzles, who liked long things, she placed especially lengthy chocolate eclairs crammed with whipping cream, which they gobbled up with great cat smiles from the beginning to the end.